I'm telling you, you're in store for a treat tonight. My dear friend, all the way from Indiana, he and his precious wife, Taylor, are here with us with their family and many of their church members. Um, I got to know him, golly, I guess a year ago, maybe longer than that, a year and a half ago, at a leaders conference where I met you. And you touched my heart back then. Taylor, I remember seeing both of you just on your face before the Lord. Um, our house is blessed tonight. This is a voice that God's using, raised up for these times. I want you to put your hands together and help me welcome Paul Johnson to this platform tonight. Come on, can we give God some praise tonight? Just stay on your feet just for one more minute. Father, thank you. Jesus, you are so good. Come on, what has he done for you lately? God, I thank you that you are more than enough, that you are faithful to fulfill your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you sent me here tonight to remind your people that you are a God who delivers, that you are a God who saves, that you are a God who never gives up, who never throws us away. Lord, I thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody lift up a shout of praise tonight. Hallelujah. The King is here. He's among us. The train of His robe is filling this house. <sighs> Glory to the Lord. Y'all can be seated. It is an honor, a privilege. I'm so humbled to be here tonight so grateful to God. I need you to know something. The North Georgia revival has changed my life. The North Georgia revival has changed my marriage. It's changed my family. It's changed our church, our father's house in Avon, Indiana. I'm just so, so grateful, so humbled to be here with you tonight. Well, listen, I've got a word. Somebody say, I got a word. I got a word, but it's a weighty word. This word came to me in 2022. When I first came to this revival, the Lord said something to me very unusual, and I've been carrying this word since then. So I have been waiting and praying and fasting and seeking God about the release of this moment. So when Todd Smith called me, I knew that the Lord immediately wanted me to go in this direction. I had a very unusual encounter when I was here at the North Georgia Revival in October of 2022. But in order for you to receive what I'm going to say, I need you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. And I want to plow in the scriptures just for a little bit because I need to lay a foundation from the word of God so that you can receive what I believe the Lord said to me. And while you're turning to John chapter 5, the Lord asked me if I would give him my notes. So at about three o'clock today, I turned over my notes to the Lord. So I've got a full heart, my sword, and a word from the Lord. Are you ready? So if this doesn't go well, you can contact me directly at Jeremiah at propheticprotocols.com forward slash donate. John chapter 5. Father, we open our hearts. To you tonight, Lord, would you speak? Holy Spirit, have your way. Lord, we thank you for the precious anointing of your spirit. And we're asking tonight that you would release a wave of healing in this house. That you would do what only you can do. Lord, we call upon your name. And we thank you for the mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit that you promised again and again and again. Lord, would you do it tonight in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. John chapter five. I just want to lay a foundation here. We're going to look at three places and have some fun and see what God does. Let's begin in verse one of John chapter five. It says, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool. Would you say pool? Into the pool and stirred up the water. 
Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in and was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Verse 5. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time. Would you say a long time? A long time in that condition. He said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Whoever said that what God is doing here isn't scriptural, apparently John 5 just didn't make it in their Bible. Uh, they didn't ask me to say this, but my God, let me say it for you. When the angel of the Lord comes and stirs the waters, you just want to get in the water. God is not limited by our unbelief. God doesn't need our permission to be God. God is God all by himself. Yes. So I don't care if you get healed in water, if you get healed in fire, or you get healed in peanut oil from Chick-fil-A. Whatever God is doing, I want to bless it, and I want to thank God for the kingdom everywhere I see it. And God is moving in the waters of Dawsonville, Georgia. And it has nothing to do with the water. It has everything to do with God. It's nameless, it's faceless, so that he gets all the credit, all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. So let your heart be full of faith tonight because the Lord is here and he's a healer. It is his name. I think the first time my brother was here, he jumped headlong over there into the baptismal. I'm like, dear God, how do I one up that? It says that Jesus knew he was sick for a long time. 38 years. That's older than me. 38 years. He was in that condition laying by the pool when the waters would be stirred up and somebody would get in before him. He knew that he was in that condition a long time. I'm telling you by the Spirit of the Lord that I know that God sent me here with this word for the beginning of 2024 because there are some people in here tonight and maybe watching online that you have been in that condition for a long time, but the Lord knows about your condition and the enemy would want to tell you that God doesn't see, that God doesn't know, and God doesn't care, but I I came here to tell on the devil tonight that he is a liar. He is a filthy, rotten thief. Don't you listen to the voice of the accuser. God sees, God knows, and God heals because God is not on trial. Turn with me to John 1. John chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 19. When I was here, the Lord said to me, I am moving in the water, but the enemy is waiting in the hallway. I am moving in the water, but the enemy is waiting in the hallway. I don't know if you've been baptized here, but you come down and then there, there's a hallway back there now. I don't think that the Lord means physically that the devil's actually in the hallway. So if you want to go back there and do the shabonky donkey, then go for it. I probably can't stop you. But I believe that the Lord is revealing something here. And I believe that there's an elephant in the room that we need to address and that God wants to help us work through. And that element, that elephant is disappointment. God said to me that disappointment is the doorway to deception. All of us have to steward 
disappointment in our lives. Did you know that disappointment is actually a mark of faith? Because people that don't get their faith up and don't get their hopes up never get disappointed. They just live numb. They just live dumb. They just live out of touch with the way God made them. So if you're here tonight and you're disappointed, maybe 2023 wasn't the year that you wanted to be. I've got good news for you. Don't open the door of deception. See, because our disappointments in life and everybody goes through them and everybody has them, our disappointments in life are something not just to go through, but something to steward. In other words, it's not an obstacle, it's an opportunity. Because what I'm going to show you from the Word of God tonight is this. Disappointment has the power to deceive you, To blind you to Christ. To ruin your walk with God and your relationships. This is very serious. Do you feel the weight of the word tonight? John chapter 1 verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah, the prophet said, I need you to know something that God is raising up John the Baptist forerunners in this hour. And I believe that you're here tonight to receive a commissioning from the Lord that you would say, I am a voice. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. I am a voice of one that says, make straight the way of the Lord. I am a voice who will not tolerate darkness, who will not look the other way at deception. I am a voice. And because I have a voice, I cannot remain silent in this hour of darkness. I've got to speak up. But first, you got to wake up and you've got to contend for the faith. God is looking for voices all across this nation in the world who would not tolerate darkness, who would not look the other way at deception, but who would stand firm in the faith and say enough is enough with the nonsense. I'm a voice. Make straight the way of the Lord. Just as Isaiah said, keep reading verse 24. Now they had sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John the Baptist answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. Get that. John is challenging them. Hey, you don't know who he is, but I do. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Does it sound like John knew Jesus? I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that Jesus is the Son of God. Does it sound like John knew Jesus? Does it sound like John saw God authenticate and authorize his son, Jesus? Keep reading. 
Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. Verse 36. And behold, he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the lamb of God. Now catch this. John knows Jesus. Remember that they were family. Yes, they were cousins. Their mothers were sisters and their family. But he had a revelation that this isn't just my cousin. This is the Messiah. This is the son of God. He says twice, he's the lamb of God. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And I sense by the spirit tonight, there are some of you that you are bothered in your conscience by some sin in your life, and you need to know that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away your sin. He's here tonight to lead you away from sin and lead you into righteousness and holiness. He's here to bless you, to build you up, and to raise you in your faith. But you need to know that there's an offering of mercy here tonight before the Son of God. Don't leave these doors living in sin. Don't walk out of this place pretending that you don't have an issue when you do. And let the conviction of the Holy Spirit lead you to life and freedom in Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So he knows Jesus. He's the son of God. Behold, he even gets that. Hey, even though he was born after me, um, he existed before the world began. So he knows that Jesus is the eternal son of God, that he's come to take away the sin of the world. But watch this. Turn to Matthew 11. And we're going to see John the Baptist singing a different tune. Matthew chapter 11. Because something happens to John the Baptist that gets a hold of his heart. Matthew 11 verse 1. It says, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, while imprisoned, would you say imprisoned? While imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. What happened to John the Baptist? How did John go from saying that Jesus is the son of God? That he's the lamb of God twice. That I saw the spirit descending and remaining on this man. I'm not the Christ. I came here to serve him. No, he's the Christ, the lamb of God. And yet here is John sending messengers to Jesus. And it sounds like a different person. Jesus, are you the one or should we look for someone else? Are you the expected one? What happened to John the Baptist? He was in prison. He was incarcerated. Now listen, John wasn't imprisoned because he was out there messing around and acting foolish. John the Baptist was thrown into prison because he stood for righteousness. Because he dared to challenge a king and say, you can't have your brother's wife. This is wrong. And they threw a little birthday party. And instead of bringing out a cake, John the Baptist's head was brought out on a platter. So let me tell you something. If you're going to preach repentance... You better pledge your head to heaven first. You better make sure that you know that you know that you know because it's going to cost you something. See, this is my experience in 10 years of ministry is that people will flock to grace and mercy and love and we all enjoy those messages. But if you dare to stand and preach the word of God and challenge the moral tone of your age, if you dare to say that sex outside of marriage is a sin, if you dare to say that lust looking at a woman is perversion, 
If you dare to begin to challenge that you've got no business drinking and messing around with alcohol because you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you dare to toe that line, the hordes of hell will raise against you. But I got news for you tonight. The King of Glory is raising up messengers all over the earth that would say, I'm a voice. Say it with me. I'm a voice. I'm a voice. And I won't back down and I won't be intimidated and I won't listen to the wiles of the devil. I'm going to stand my ground. You know why? You can't have my kids. You can't have my grandchildren. I'm going to leave a legacy and a heritage of faith. Oh, I wish somebody would get bold tonight and get that cowardice broken off of you. For somebody told you that love teaches you how to be quiet when love will give you a voice and make you speak up. I love you so much. I just got to tell you the truth. But a whole generation of orphans have said, you, you didn't correct me correctly. L like you, you, you didn't hug me and hold me and kiss me for a few minutes and then just, just give me a little bit of it. No, if you're a voice, then you say, give me the truth at all costs. I don't get the privilege of, well, you didn't say it right. Just tell me the truth. Just love me enough. If I've got something going on in my life, you're not my friend if you don't speak up. Does the word of God say that deceitful are the kisses of an enemy? Some of y'all got friends. You need to get new friends that tell the truth. No, I'm telling you, you didn't hear me. You need to get some friends that tell the truth. You need to fellowship with people that live in the light. You need to fellowship with people that don't want to drink the cup of demons and the cup of the Lord. See, we think we're above bad company corrupts good morals, but it's in the word of God. It's not a nursery rhyme. It's the written God breathed word. Bad company corrupts good morals, but it's our pride that makes us think I'm the exception. Oh yeah, I I'm influencing them. No girlfriend, you've been with them for three years and everybody's still a reprobate. You need to get some friends and some Holy Ghost women and mothers in your life who are going to keep you in the truth and maybe tell you to put a few more clothes on because your worth comes from God. Because you marry at the level of your dysfunction. Wouldn't it be awesome if I just got thrown out of here? That would be great. That's my dream. Man, what a powerful testimony. Did y'all hear that? Healing from celiac disease. I realized that I've been testing and eating lots of dessert. I've been testing for 30 years to make sure I don't have celiac disease. <laughs> Thought, my God, break out the cookies and the cake. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was like, this is a holy dessert party. We're all standing to our feet. Give God some praise. Thank you, Lord. So amazing. But here, John is singing a different tune. Why? He's disappointed. John the Baptist, the one his birth was prophesied. Angelic encounters accompanied his life. God sent him into the wilderness. God raised him up. And John the Baptist is so disappointed. Why? Because his circumstances are louder than the voice of God. Because he begins to measure the goodness and the presence of God by his surroundings. This life was never meant to be a measure of God's goodness. I believe in the goodness of God. I believe in healings and miracles and salvations. We see them in our ministry. I've witnessed them here with my own eyes. But we need to talk about the power of disappointment and how so many opened that door. Why? Because the enemy is waiting in the hallway. He's waiting in that moment to whisper in your ear that God doesn't know and God doesn't care. See, God's holding out on you. 
So he's imprisoned because he challenges Herod. And he's in prison and he wants to know, Jesus, are you the expected one? Jesus responds this way. This is beautiful. Read it again. Verse four. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. This response from Jesus is fascinating to me because he doesn't just respond to John and say, John, are you serious? John, you, you baptized me to fulfill all righteousness. We grew, you know the prophecies, you know the encounters that our moms had. He doesn't say, hey, John, what are you doing? He says, go and tell John that the blind see, that the lame walk, that the deaf hear, that the poor have the gospel preached to them. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is reorienting John the Baptist's focus. He's shifting his perspective off of what God is not doing and onto what God is doing. See, disappointment comes and it wants to magnify itself. And it wants you to think about all the times that you thought God should or he didn't or it didn't go the way you wanted. See, disappointment begins to whisper in your ear. But the spirit of God wants to redirect you towards what God is doing in your life. Because gratitude releases the grace of God and gratitude creates an environment for the miraculous. So when we begin to thank the Lord and we begin to plead the blood of Jesus and we begin to contend and stand in faith for our healing, we're turning away from any disappointment and we're setting our faith and our hope on the son of God because he is not going to be measured by whether he does or he doesn't. What about all the people that believed in healing that didn't get their breakthrough that walked out of here and still loved God just as much as they came in before and came back to get baptized again? What about all the people? See, listen, this is about the keep. Can you keep praying? Can you keep believing? Can you keep contending? Can you keep preaching? Keep prophesying. Don't lose heart. What the enemy meant for evil, God turns around and uses it for good. You just got to hold on a little longer. You've just got to reach for the hem of Jesus's garment and don't let go until power flows out of him and touches you in body, soul, and spirit. But John the Baptist is disappointed. He's in prison. Jesus, we're family. If you knew, if you were really the son of God, you'd let me out of here. You would change my circumstances. You would shift things in my life. God, if you're a healer, then why aren't you healing me? See, these are many of the painful roads that I've been down in my life. I came to prayer here on Saturday night. We were here to preach at Covenant Connections this morning. So we got into Dawsonville on Saturday and the Lord told me to come here for prayer. So we were here for prayer Saturday at six o'clock. And the Lord told me to come and lay up on this stage. And all of a sudden, all the disappointment in my life came crashing down on me. And I began to weep before God. I buried my face right here. And I began to cry and snot and spit. It wasn't pretty. You're not ugly crying unless there's snot and some spit somewhere you don't want it to go. Thankfully, I have a beard to just catch it all. You got to have a beard when you're losing your hair. Some of you are disappointed in your hairline. Keep the faith, brother. You receive that Rogaine spirit. Me, I'm just accepting reality. Jeremiah's in denial, by the way. All the disappointment in my life just sat right on top of me. Why? Because I knew I wasn't coming here just to give a message. I had to be the message. 
I started thinking about my mother walking out of my life when I was a kid. And the disappointment and the pain of watching her go. And having to contend with the fact that maybe I'm not worth sticking around for. I had to wrestle through the pain of that. Then I began to think about all the ways that God blessed me. But then another disappointment. I started thinking about how I grew up poor. How I didn't have much. How God was faithful to provide. But man, we scraped by. I'm talking about growing up in the winters in Indiana. And not being able to afford the heat in 2008. Where it was so cold that my fingers and my toes were frozen. That I would wear the same sweatshirt every night. Because my nose would break open and bleed all over myself and one of the greatest breakthroughs of my childhood was the day that I got enough money to buy a space heater so that I could be warm and and actually sleep through the night anybody ever been through some disappointment Then living in an empty house, not once, but twice. Having literally no furniture because of the circumstances. I'm talking about bone dry, dead, empty. Not a couch, not a pillow, not a spoon, not a nothing. And working through that disappointment. Then we get married, Taylor and I. She's my favorite worship leader, by the way. We get married and a chronic disease that she's battled, that we've prayed, that we've wrestled, that we've struggled, that we've cried, that we've contended in faith, that has made a huge mark on our lives. That disease returns and begins to threaten our ability to have children. And the doctor looks at two 22-year-olds and says, you guys need to have kids as soon as possible. You may not be able to right now. And so we went on a journey of surgeries and pain and contending and praying and believing God and faith. And I'm praying and I'm seeing people get healed, but not my own wife. I'm laying hands on people and they're getting set free, but I'm laying hands on my wife like every night. Oh God, please heal my wife. Please heal her wound. We want to have children. You said, be fruitful and multiply, Lord. We're just trying to fulfill what you said. You put this dream in our hearts. But then God gave us David and Daniel. And we have two beautiful miracle children because God is faithful. I'm telling you that the disappointment of barrenness, some of y'all are knocking on that door of deception. You need to close it. But then we want to have more kids. God, please open her womb. Keep it open. You did it once. You can do it again. You can do it again. So we're praying and we're believing. But she's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And it's fading. And doctors can't help. And we go to have a surgery two years ago. And it's unsuccessful. And we continue to pray and believe. But then we finally reach the point where it was necessary to close that door. And I had to lay here and deal with the disappointment of losing our ability to have natural children. We were in a service at our church. The whole church gathered around Taylor. She's worshiping and praying. And everybody knows she's sick and struggling. The whole church gathers around her and lays hands on her and prays for her for healing. And four weeks later, an older woman comes up to me and says, hey, do you remember when everybody gathered around Taylor and they were praying for her? She said, I've had a back issue. I've had daily chronic pain for over 30 years and nobody prayed for me, but God healed me in that moment. Give God some praise. But that wasn't the healing anybody was focused on or believing for. See, disappointment is an opportunity to serve God when you don't understand him. Disappointment is an opportunity to continue blessing the name of the Lord even when you don't get it. Because I'm telling you, I went to some places like, Father, I do not understand. 
Anybody ever been there before? Oh, I don't understand. Father, I'm just asking right now that you would continue to open hearts. Lord, I'm asking that you would wash the disappointment out of this place. That you would heal us, your people, and that you would cause us to focus on what you're doing, on what you're saying. God, you're so good. In Jesus' name, look at verse 6. Jesus said, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. I want to exhort you tonight, don't take offense at God. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. See, but we've invented a faith that can't acknowledge reality, and that's not biblical faith. It says in Romans 4 that Abraham considered the deadness of his own body and yet believed and did not waver according to the promise of God. So this whole thing that you just got to ignore and pretend and perform, get it out of the church. You can stand in faith and say, I may be sick in my body, but God is a healer and I'm not quitting and I'm not giving up and I'm not going to measure God by what he's not doing. I'm going to stand in faith and bless the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Forget none of his benefits. All that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, if I had opened the door to deception, I wouldn't even be preaching here tonight. I wouldn't have remained in ministry. I would have quit a long time ago. Is there a man here tonight that preaches? And sometimes when he gets riled up, he says, oh, y'all don't want to hear me preach. Do y'all know anybody like that? Come up here for a second. I need you up here. Y'all, y'all help me welcome this apostolic father and voice to our nation. <laughs> now we're having fun. <laughs> okay, we didn't plan this, but we're going to have a little fun. I chose you because you're as, about as big as a door. Okay. <laughs> like I could fit inside you. <laughs> Let's pretend, just face the people. That he is the door, for a moment, of that disappointment. And disappointment begins to speak to you. And disappointment begins to minister to you. And disappointment is waiting. I need you to see it and know it. That God is telling you what is behind the door is the voice of the devil and the accuser. He's going to want you to open that door. He's going to want you to find out what's behind. But by the Lord Jesus, I charge you, do not open the door of disappointment. You stand in faith. You believe in the promises of God. Whatever you do, do not quit because God is not on trial. You don't want to find out what's back here because I'm telling you, it's nasty and it's from the pit of hell. It's where real demons live and it's where some of the people in your family like to talk to you from. Ooh, you're at that revival again. You know, ain't none of that real. Oh, yes, it is because God is real and it doesn't matter. What you think, God isn't measured by your unbelief. And he's not going to be measured by my disappointment. Why? Because my love for Jesus and my honor for the king far outweighs anything I don't see or don't experience in this life. Thank you. Don't you open the door. Proverbs 13 and verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I'm telling you that some of you are sick right here. Some of you have been ignoring. Some of you have been trying not to feel it. Some of y'all have been trying to dismiss it and faith your way through it. But there's a measure of reality that God wants to bring that says, I want you to acknowledge the disappointment so that I can heal you and be your father and walk with you through it. It's not a lack of faith for you to acknowledge, hey, I've got some pain here. I've got some hurt here. I've got some things that didn't go my way. Remember that disappointment is a sign of faith. You dared to believe. 
Some people, they never get disappointed because they're never going to take that much risk. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but dreams, desires fulfilled are a tree of life. I believe that God is going to heal some people tonight that you've been in that condition a long time. You've been praying, you've been waiting, you've been believing. I came here out of the cornfields of Indiana to stand in faith with you tonight. That this is your night. That after all this time, God knows that you're in that condition. And God can and will heal you tonight on January 7th, 2024. Oh, I wish there was some faith in the room tonight. Imagine what God could do with all the faith in the room. When there's a moment of healing, you would be better off repenting for your unbelief than faking it. If that's not where you are, just fall to your knees and say, God, forgive me for my doubt and my unbelief. A.W. Tozer says that the father... Of fear is unbelief. Unbelief gives birth to fear. Unbelief is a sin. Hey. I said unbelief is a sin. It's not a pet. It's not something you want to keep around. God has called us to be a people of faith. Oh, y'all don't want to hear me preach tonight. No, did Jesus say to Thomas, stick your finger right here in my hand? Right here, right now. He said, call a halt to your unbelief and become one who is believing right now. Some of y'all need to stick your finger in the crucified, nail-scarred hands of Jesus again. You need to plead the blood of Jesus that he rose from the grave, that he loves you, that he sees you, that he knows you. I'm telling you, some of y'all are going to break up with demonic spirits that are lying to you and deceiving you and telling you all this trash about God. And you're going to get your faith back tonight. You're going to get your hope back tonight. You're going to become that man and woman of faith that you always wanted to be because you're going to look in the face of disappointment and say, God is greater than my disappointment. Don't open the door. I want to give you three keys to stewarding disappointment well because I said earlier that it's not an obstacle, it's an opportunity. The first key to stewarding disappointment well, number one, is asking the right questions. When we go through disappointment, we need to ask the right questions of God and the situation. See, there's a difference between asking God questions and questioning him. There's a difference between accusing him in your heart and simply inquiring from a place of humility. How many of you know God likes real conversations? If you're still repeating prayers, it might be time to grow up and engage with the Father in a meaningful way. Ask the right questions. Don't ask why. Why is the enemy's favorite question behind that door? Why? God, why? I don't understand why. No, ask, Father, what are you trying to teach me? Father, what are you doing in my life? Father, I know that you're up to something good. Lord, I know that even if it doesn't turn out, you are still worthy and you are still good. I wish some people had the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that says, even if not, even if we burn up like Chris, God is still good. Ask the right questions. Number two, confess the goodness of God. This is an important point. Confess the goodness of God. God, you are good because you are good because you are good. See, I get concerned when everything's going well and people say God is good. Can you say that when things aren't good? 
Can you say that when you're sick? Can you say that when you're struggling? Can you say that when you're barren? Can you say that when you miscarry? Can you say that when you're divorced? Can you say that when you get fired? Can you continue to confess that God is good? This is my declaration. I will not be moved out of the place of faith. See, because I wonder if real faith has everything to do with trust. I will trust him even when I don't understand him because I'm not God and he doesn't need my permission. I don't un have to understand why this or why that or why some and why not. I'm not going to measure God. I'm not going to put him on trial. I'm going to ask him the right questions like, Father, is there anything in my life that I need to get rid of? Lord, show me if I'm carrying something, if I'm doing something to quench and grieve your spirit so that I can get in alignment with what you want to do, which is heal me and bless me and deliver me and save me. Ask the right questions. Confess the goodness of God. And the last thing is to let your pain be fuel to the fire of your faith. You got to let your pain be fuel to the fire of your faith. There are only two kinds of people in the whole world. I said two. There are those that allow their pain to be a bridge to God and those that allow their pain to be a barrier to the Lord. God wants to turn your barrier into a bridge. I'm telling you that from the place of pain, you can seek God in such a real way. You can cry out to the Lord from a place of humility and brokenness that is a sweet aroma before your father. God wants to meet some people tonight in that place of brokenness and pain. He wants to renew faith in the room tonight. He wants to restore your heart. He wants to wash and cleanse the bruises and the diseases of his people. Do you feel the presence of God tonight? I want you to put your Bibles down and just put your hand over your heart if you're willing tonight. God, I thank you that you're moving in the waters here in Dawsonville, Georgia. Lord, I thank you that you're faithful. That even when we are faithless, you remain faithful for you cannot deny yourself. Father, we're asking right now that you would release a wave of healing. Father, those that are walking through valleys, the Lord's just telling me that there are some of you here tonight that you just recently experienced the death of a loved one. Somebody that you were close to, somebody that you knew has recently passed away and the Lord has brought you here tonight so that the pain of their passing would not pollute you but would purify you in his presence. God, we're asking that you would wash away all disappointment. God, we choose tonight not to accuse you. We choose this day to confess that you are good. Can you say that tonight? God, you are good. Just begin to confess the goodness of God. Begin to bless the Lord from a real place. Don't do it from a forced place. Begin to pray with me. Father, you are good. We thank you, Lord, that you're a healer, that your name is Jehovah Rapha, that you are the God who heals. God, we're asking tonight for a great wave of healing that would touch body, soul, and spirit. God, I thank you for the outpouring of miracles. Father, I thank you that this is week 309 of one of the most historic outpourings of your spirit, of one of the most incredible demonstrations of power that our nation has seen. God, I thank you that the North Georgia revival is a springboard for the third great awakening that you're releasing in this nation. Father, I thank you that as disappointment washes away, that that faith is rising. That hope is rising. If you are in a valley, if you are battling, if you are wrestling, I want you to stand to your feet and come down to this altar. Do not let the enemy keep you in your seat when there are things that you need to deal with and do business with God. The Lord didn't send me here tonight for just a few. I believe there's many. It always gets easier as people come forward. So don't watch. Just come down now.
God's going to wash away disappointment, but you got to acknowledge it first. You got to say, Lord, this is where I've been at. This is what we've been working through. He already knows you're not informing him. You're not telling him anything new. Just come all the way to the front. Step all the way forward to make room for others. There's a lot of people that are responding to the word of the Lord tonight. God, I thank you that you're going to open barren wombs tonight. I know this is a praying house. I need some help in this moment. Would you begin to pray? If you're not down here, pray like it's your family. Oh, God, I ask that you would let the tears flow tonight because tears are your agents of healing. Father, we acknowledge the disappointment. We acknowledge the pain. We acknowledge the hurt. We acknowledge the betrayal. We acknowledge all the people that have walked out on us. Lord, we acknowledge it before you in this moment. And God, we're asking for a mighty wave of your Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit, would you comfort your people tonight? God, we determine not to measure you by our unbelief. We've determined and decided tonight that you are good because you are good. You are God and there is no other. Just stretch your hands out towards the people in these altars. And I just have this sense from the Lord that some of you are going to get back in ministry. I don't know who's here tonight and you stepped away for a season. But perhaps it was disappointment that deceived you and caused you to step away. But the call of God is given. The gifts of God are given irrevocably. He doesn't take them back. You're still called even if you don't want to be called anymore. those of you that are stretching out your hands I want you to pray in the Holy Spirit come on we need some help tonight I'm telling you there's real breakthrough there's real freedom God we ask you for healing from divorce from the pain of rejection Disappointment is being washed away in the presence of Jesus. The King is here. He's among us. The Father loves His people. And He's here tonight to heal your broken heart. He's here to restore. He's giving beauty for ashes. This is what He does. you're our healer God we acknowledge the pain but we thank you Lord that the pain is fuel to our fire God I thank you that we're putting fresh wood on the fire 
We're putting fresh wood on the altar tonight. God, would you come and consume us as living sacrifices? Keep praying with me, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit is moving. of the barren tonight. Lord, I thank you that this is my revenge to see many barren wounds open. Heal blind eyes. Heal deaf ears. Wash away the shame and the betrayal. person in this room be able to say like the Apostle Paul I have fought the good fight I have kept the faith I have finished the race I thank you Lord for the keeping of the faith tonight that we're going to burn brighter because of this we're going to live hotter and more on fire because we've placed our pain before you those of you that are receiving ministry tonight I want to challenge you to something I want you to ask the Lord, God, what is my revenge? Because God is so good and he's so faithful that he's going to send you into those places of brokenness and he's going to use you to manifest his kingdom where you were wounded, where you were hurt, where you were broken, where you were busted and disgusted. God is a good God and he gives us revenge against our enemy. Taylor and I have had the privilege of praying for many people and to see them be able to have children. And by the way, we're believing God for the funds and the means for adoption. You know why? Because we're going to stick it to them some more. Why? Because we refuse to let him win. Don't let the enemy have the last word. He doesn't have the final say. Jesus does. All across this room, if you're willing to stretch your hands towards the Lord. Those of you that are sitting, I want to ask you to stand. God, we acknowledge your precious presence here tonight. Holy Spirit, have your way. God, we want all that you want. Do what only you can do. Lord, I thank you that you're the healer tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that faith is in the room. Father, I thank you for healing for every sickness and every disease. You are the God who heals all our diseases, who saves us from the pit. Lord, we bless your name right now. Just begin to bless the name of the Lord with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, you are good. You are faithful. You are awesome in power and splendor. There is no one like you, Lord. Worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory. Who is like the Lord? No one is like our God. Come on, sing it tonight. Let a song flow forth from your heart. Let God put a new song in your heart. Be praised. opportunity to offer the Lord worship right now in the midst of your pain. You won't get that chance in heaven. Father, be praised.
I believe there's quite a few here tonight that you weren't planning on being baptized because you've been baptized before. I want to exhort you to get in the water again. It says of Abraham that his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Let your faith arise as an aroma before the Lord. So anybody here tonight that feels led to get baptized again? God, I'm going to get baptized again. They've got scrubs for you. There's clothing for you. There's towels. Everything's all laid out for you. And at this time, I want to welcome up group A. If you have the letter A on your sheet, if you signed up to be immersed tonight, I'm telling you, God is going to move in these waters powerfully. Father, we're asking that you would stir these waters again. Lord, we're asking the way that you did at the pool of Bethesda. God, would you stir the waters in Dawsonville, Georgia? Father, we're asking for unprecedented miracles. We're believing, Lord, that there would be an outpouring of the Spirit that every single person, every man, woman, and child would be healed tonight. Because why not? You are good. If you have the letter A, just go ahead and step up these stairs here. I believe that the Lord is going to put intercession on some of your hearts. Some of you may have been planning on going home and leaving in this moment, but perhaps you could stay for just a few minutes and intercede on behalf of those who are going to be baptized tonight and believe for their breakthrough. Is anybody willing to do that? Is there anybody here tonight that can say, I can give 15 minutes. I can hang around for just a few more minutes and I can pray and I can ask God to move with all the fire of my faith. Come on, show me some hands. I see more hands going up. God is cultivating fresh faith and fresh fire tonight. We're not giving up and we're not quitting. God is just getting started. I'm telling you that the Lord is just beginning in this revival. If you've been waiting for almost six years for this thing to go away, I say, bless God, it's going to be here when Jesus splits the eastern sky because the Lord has determined to move in this house.